5, and this is the second week that we are uh, launching into this multi-week series on contentment, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 5, Paul's writing to this young preacher in training by the name of Timothy. And Paul says, I pick up in verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So right off the bat, Paul is telling Timothy, if you ever hear anybody preaching that if God is blessing you, he must approve of the way you're living. Paul said, walk away from that person because that person is in false doctrine. Then he sets the record straight in verse number 6 and he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It is certain we cannot carry anything out. It is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So again, as I mentioned last week, Paul is not saying necessarily it's a sin to have wealth and to work hard and to be frugal and smart, but it is wrong to, be, to, to search after riches. You should, not, you should not have as a focus of your life wanting to be rich. Notice he said, they that will be rich. So people that get out of bed every day and say, I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I just got to follow money today. I got I to gotta do better. Y- y- your motives are wrong. Amen. Here's why. Verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil. Again, not, not money, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Everybody say flee. So everything that we just talked about in verses 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, he tells Timothy, this young protege, flee these things. Don't follow after the love of money. Don't follow after materialism. Don't follow after greed. He said, here's what you follow after. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, he said. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I charge thee in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot unrebukable. How long? Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So has the Lord come yet? Well I hope not because we're all still here. He hasn't come yet. So we're to follow this commandment all the way to the rapture. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And then verse 17, Paul goes back to this idea that he was talking about in verses 5 through 10. He said, charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain Riches. Everybody say uncertain. But in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So he goes back and he says, look, there are going to be some people that are rich in the things of this world. Those people, Paul said, you tell them that they better be careful. Don't be high-minded. Don't walk around and think you're somebody. Because riches are uncertain. Ask anybody who's lost it all in the market crashes over the last several decades. They'll tell you, riches are uncertain. Ask anybody that invested in Bitcoin when it was at its highest and then when it went out or down and they lost money. Ask anybody that invested in Dogecoin when it was at its highest and and went all the way down. Ask anybody that, that was really heavily invested in the real estate market in 2008 when the whole market crashed and they lost everything. Riches are uncertain. Say, well, what can I trust in, Pastor? Paul said in verse 17, in the only living God. Trust in Him, because He giveth us all things to enjoy. Verse 18, he says, tell the rich people they should do good. They should be rich in good works. They should be ready to distribute. They should be willing 
to communicate. They should lay up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So somebody that has been blessed with material things, they don't need to be stingy and greedy and, and, and a prude about it. They should be willing to help other people. Verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. There are things that science does corroborate to be true with the scripture. But then there is this idea that there is science falsely so called. So the carbon dating method would be science falsely so called. When you can take a Coke bottle from the 19th century and run a carbon dating on it and it comes back to be 25 million years old, something's wrong with that system. Because the Coke bottle is not 25 million years old. The whole world is not 25 million years old. Somebody say amen. Okay, so <clears throat> last week we started with this idea of contentment. And let me tell you, discontentment is a spiritual maladjustment of the mind and spirit. And I believe that discontentment is a mighty tool that Satan uses to incite divorce and rebellion and worldliness and excessive debt spending and a lot of times as an extreme suicide. You and I as Christians need to learn to just settle down and be content with where God has placed us in life. He said if you have food and if you have raiment, be content. Now think about how simplistic that is. Not if you have your 401k fully funded and you've got some stocks and bonds and your, your savings account is, is, is doing well and, and your house is paid off, then you can be content. That's not what he said. If you have food and if you have raiment. Those are basic necessities. If you've got a little something on your stomach and you've got some clothes on your back, Paul said to Timothy, be happy. Because God will take care of the rest of it. Somebody say amen. Last week we started in depth with an overview of life and then a formula for true riches. And we obtained that formula from 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 6. Let's go back there, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. This is just review. And if you remember algebra back in the day or calculus back in the day, A plus B equals C. And so we said godliness is the A, contentment is the B, Great gain is the sum. So godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Godliness plus contentment equals great gain. Now that flies in the face of what a lot of TV evangelists are preaching and teaching. A lot of TV evangelists preach and teach, well, buy my book and then you'll be able to have the secret of great gain. You are wasting your money when you buy these snake oil salesmen's books. There is no secret in their book for you to, to have great gain. I'll tell you where the secret is. It's in this book. And it's free. <laughs> you don't have to pay for it. It's a free, free formula there. Godliness, living a godly life, plus contentment, having food and raiment, equals great gain. Christians are amazing people. They can be walking around in a recession while everybody is losing everything. And Christians can have a smile on their face. Because they got a little bit of food in their stomach, they got some clothes on their back, and they're living a godly life. You can't take that peace away from people. A Christian can lose everything they have and be completely displaced when it comes to how the world views success. But if they're living a godly life and they got a little bit of food and they got some clothes, they can walk around and say, I'm down, but I'm not out. My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he can turn it around. And may look like it's bad right now, but I don't trust in horses and chariots and the things of this world. I trust in the one true saving God. And God can turn it around. Now, last week we stopped at this point and I'd like to pick up. This is new material going forward. The scripture gives a warning to people who have, but also a warning to people that have not. And if you've been listening to me uh, ministering any amount of time over the last couple decades, you've heard me say this. The same pride that causes a wealthy person to park their nice, big, shiny car right up front so everybody in the church sees it when they're coming in is the same pride that causes the poor person 
to park their junkie car in the very back so nobody sees it. It's all the same pride. Okay? Does that make sense? So whatever you have, be content with it. Don't flaunt it, but then don't be ashamed either. If you have a nice car, God bless you. We'll rejoice with them that rejoice. If you don't have a nice car, maybe we can hear you coming before we see you coming. I've had some cars like that. Amen. <laughs> you knew they were coming because you could hear them coming. Yep, here comes pastor. Right? So be it. Don't be ashamed of it. This is what God has given me. I'm not going to go park it around behind the modular so nobody sees it. Neither am I going to be right up front so everybody sees it. I'm just going to say, God has blessed me. I have what I have. I'm thankful for it. But it could all be gone tomorrow. I'm going to be content. Right? So here's the warning to those that have and those that don't have. Identified as, by Paul as those that, who have not, but yet they are possessed with a desire for worldly attainment. These are overly ambitious poor people who have lost their moorings and are adrift on the sea of discontent. Solemnly, Paul warns them of tragic results of having this driving desire and this ambition and this unrelenting energy only to get money. Paul says, you're going to be very, very, very sad with the result of that. You see, the basis and the root cause of all these problems is the love of money. Look at it, folks. Look at, look at the news that we see on a regular basis. You can take uh, the, 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 the people that are falling and being charged with crimes and being in prison and, 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 and politicians that are being exposed as corrupt and, and movie stars and, 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 and NBA players and sports players. And when it all gets down to it, if you really get to the root of it, somewhere there's a problem with money. Am I being honest? Maybe it was the politician accepting bribes. Maybe it was the NBA player who snorted up all of his earnings in cocaine, right? Maybe it was the wealthy business person who got involved in gambling. Somewhere at the root of it, when you start pulling that thread, by the time you get to the end of the thread, there's the love of money. Not money, but the love of money. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money produces covetousness. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Everybody say covetousness. Now, as children of God, we are admonished to flee covetousness. What is covetousness? Covetousness is when a person looks at another person and desires what they have. They covet after that. I want that house. I want that car. I want your profession. I want your spouse. See, covetousness comes from the love of money. And when you begin to covet things, you begin to want things that if God would have wanted you to have them, he'd have given them to you. Let me say that again. If God would have wanted you to have it, he'd have given it to you. But apparently at this point, at this stage in our lives, he doesn't want us to have it. So I shouldn't say to God, you don't know what you're doing. I'm smarter than you. I want that and I want it now. What you're doing is you're saying, God, you are mistaken about where I am in life and what you can trust me with. God knows what he can trust you with. And he knows what he cannot trust you with. Verse 11 of 1 Timothy 6, we should follow instead of covetousness, we should follow after righteousness. We should follow after godliness we should follow after faith and love and patience and meekness he lists six different qualities that the saint of god should follow after think about what that means to follow after verse 11 he says we should flee from these things that uh, he has warned us about covetousness and we should follow after so i run from the qualities of the world and i follow after the qualities that jesus has for me i ask you this morning saint of god watching online or in person are we really doing that let's stop and look at our lives and say am i really conscientiously running from the things that satan is offering me and following after the things that god is offering me are we doing that? Are we living in such a way that the Lord would look at us and say, yeah, yeah, I see. They're fleeing from some things and they are following after some things. 
People that are rich, he said, will fall into temptation. People that will be rich, I should say, will fall into temptation, will fall into a snare, will fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts. And he goes on to say these things will drown men in destruction and perdition, will cause a person to err in the faith, and will pierce them through with many sorrows. You may be sitting here today and say, Pastor, if I could just, man, if I could just get a job making six figures, if I could just get a job doing this, if I could just get a house big enough. Hey, let me tell you, the higher you get in the things of this world, the bigger the bills get. Okay? The bigger the stress, the bigger the anxiety. Amen? Think about that. Is that really what you want? It doesn't get less stressful the higher you get. It gets more stressful. You say, well, I'm stressed out. I'm just sitting here eating beanie weenies and crackers, and I'm broke as Job's turkey. Well, life's pretty simple. It sounds to me like life's pretty simple, right? How'd you like to be sitting around eating a steak but owing tens of thousands of dollars tomorrow in a certain thing? That's kind of stressful. I'm not speaking of myself. I'm just saying that the higher you get, the more stressful things are. So sometimes we should just settle down and say, you know, I don't want to fall after these things and fall into temptation. Paul now focuses on people that already have riches, holdings, and possessions. So he warns people that will be rich. Notice he says, they that will be rich, and he warns them. And then he talks about those that are rich and have possessions and holdings and riches. So there's danger zones for both of them. But also, there's a danger zone for people that are poor. In fact, there's more danger, I think, in some cases. By inheritance or God's blessings upon their efforts, you know, as they keep going and as they keep working, God can bless them and certainly they can come out of that. People that are rich and have, have obtained money by inheritance or through their effort sometimes have a tendency to be heady and high-minded. And again, I'll say it's not a sin to have things of this world. It's not a sin to be wealthy in the estimation of this world. But you should never flaunt your wealth and you should never walk around and act like you've arrived because God has the ability to take it from you. Go back to verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. So they shouldn't be high-minded. You ever known anybody that came into a little bit of money and it just changed the whole way they act? Right? You ever known anybody that had nothing and maybe they got a settlement of some sort and, I mean, they just, the next 30 or 60 days until the money ran out, they just acted weird. And then when the money ran out, they were back to their normal self. What is it about money that causes people to act strange? It's uncertain. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Right? I mean, I remember my kids were tiny and, and things were extremely tight and get a tax refund check and think, oh man, woo, wow. And seven days later, you're like, oh, well, that didn't last long. Am I the only one? Come on, folks. What is it about money that causes us to act strange? And Paul really deals with that. And he says, don't be high-minded. Don't trust in uncertain riches. Do good when you have the ability to do good. How could a rich person do good? They could help people in a time of need. They see somebody that needs, James chapter 1 talks about this. If you see a person and it's cold and they need a coat, don't say, be blessed, my brother, go and be warm. He said, give them a coat. I mean, you can bless somebody all you want, but they'll freeze to death while you're blessing them. Or, or somebody that's hungry, say, be fed. No, 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 but give them some rice and beans and make sure they're fed. Do good. Amen. A person that God has blessed should, of course, take a little more responsibility on and help people. I appreciate the way in this church how when God has blessed some congregants in this church. And when there's a young person that has a need or there's a situation, they step up and they say, yeah, I'll sponsor that person. I appreciate that. What, what are you doing? That, that, that person is accepting a little more responsibility and saying, you know what? God has blessed me. Maybe all my kids are grown and gone and I don't have to put three campers through camp at the same time. So I'm going to sponsor one of these kids because I know what camp can do for their life. That's what we should do. 
That's what we should do. Amen. If you have some cars around and extra cars and they're in good shape and you see somebody that maybe needs a vehicle, maybe it's a dire situation, donate that vehicle to them. God, what's going to happen? God's going to bless you. I could sell that. Yeah, you could, but you could also give it and let God pay you back. Because God said, when you loan to the poor, you're loaning to me. And let me tell you something. God always pays his bills. Okay? So be rich in good works. Be ready to distribute. Be willing to communicate, which means to fellowship with other people. That's a good one. That's a big one right there. If God ever blesses you to the point where you begin to have some status and some things, don't ever get too powerful that you can't fellowship with the common person. That you can't sit and talk with just normal people. That you can't sit and eat with just normal people. We have a potluck after church. Oh, well, I can't go in there and eat with the common people. Oh, sit down, shut up. Get you a hot dog. You ain't that important. Right? Come on, man. Float on down to earth. Don't ever get so high and important that you can't sit and eat with common people and fellowship with common people. Somebody say amen. I've had some clients over the years that were filthy wealthy, and you'd never know it. They walked in wearing the same blue jeans they've been wearing 10 years and Shoes that needed a cobbler and a Ford F-150. It looks like it needed a new set of tires and chewing on a piece of straw. Then I've had people walk in that act like they got a sign. I'm rich. And when you get down into it, they really don't have nothing. It's just arrogance. Amen. I want to be like the, the farmer that you would never even think. You would never know. Be willing to fellowship with other people. Amen. Make up your mind that if God blesses me today and I become filthy wealthy, that I'm still going to fellowship with common people and I'm going to love common people. Somebody say amen. amen. Then he said, lay up and store a good foundation against the time to come. So there's nothing wrong with saving. There's nothing wrong with putting away for a rainy day. I believe also when you give to the poor and you help that you're laying up a foundation in heaven. Amen. So this is sound advice to both groups of people, people that will be rich, and people that are rich, both sets of people, are warned in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Sound advice. And we either have it, money, or we don't. But in either case, danger exists, and of these dangers, we are warned. So everybody in the building here is, is in one of two camps. You either have it or you don't. And Paul warns both sets of people in the same chapter. Now, Here's some attitudes that we should have toward money in the last days. I believe this applies to men and women. I believe this applies to no matter what uh, race or creed or culture you are, a minister, a saint, it doesn't matter. If we're human, these attitudes apply. Number one, riches. Riches is a strange bird. Let's go to Proverbs 23, 5. And Solomon actually compares riches to being a strange bird. And I'll read to you why it's strange. You say, well, what's so strange about it, Pastor? Well, he tells us. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? Riches certainly make themselves wings, and they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So riches is a strange bird because it doesn't have feathers or wings, but suddenly it grows wings and flies away. My mom used to, when she'd hand me my allowance when I was a kid in coins, you know, she'd put it in my hand, say, don't let it burn a hole in your pocket. You ever heard that phrase? Don't let it burn a hole in your pocket. Or don't spend it all in one place. And I look at that, you know, 25 cents and think, oh, okay, I'll be sure not to spend it all in one place. Right? Riches are funny like that. You might have some money in the bank. And unless you're very careful and you're writing it all down and keeping a checkbook register, I'm still, I keep checkbook registers. I am, I'm very OCD about that. And if I balance my checkbook at the end of the month and I'm a penny off, it drives me crazy. I'm like, oh man, where is that penny? Man, I don't like it when I'm off. But some people don't do that. Some people don't even have a checkbook register. They just have a debit card. And if I'm talking to you, I'm not, I promise you, I'm not looking right at you. That would give me anxiety. To, to use that and not keep up with it, that just worry me to death. But some people are like this. Oh, I'll just swipe this and get this. and I'll swipe that. And they're kind of in their mind. They're kind of keeping rough track. And, and, you know, if you do that, you get to the end of the month. Oh, wait, hold on. I don't have enough money. That's riches for you. They just grow wings and fly away. 
Sometimes they fly away on the 10th of the month. Sometimes they fly away on the 15th of the month. Sometimes the 30th of the month. They're strange like that. That's what he said. Have you ever witnessed this truth in your life? You ever witnessed this truth in the life of somebody else? I remember when I was in Durham as youth pastor there, I was a night manager at Honey's Restaurant on um, Guest Road. They bulldozed it now. It no longer exists, but it was a 24-hour restaurant right on I-85, the Guest Road exit, and I was, I was the night manager, third shift, so 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., and uh, this is when I was uh, young and single and youth pastor. And so I remember a guy came in, and he had all the trappings of a very wealthy person, he drove in in a very large car. He had uh, very expensive clothes on and jewelry all over. And it was obvious he was flaunting his wealth. And so he sat down and he had this, uh, this, this kind of weirdo that would come and sit with him also, kind of like his assistant. And the manager that was leaving the second shift pulled me aside and said, that guy right there, you want to know his story? I said, sure. He said, he won millions of dollars in the lottery a couple years ago and he's lost it all. He's gambled every bit of it. And said, here in a couple hours, when the bar's let out, there'll be some bookies that'll come in. And those bookies, he owes monies to those bookies. So he'll be gone before they get in. Oh, wow. So sure enough, we went over. I saw the waiter go over. What would you like to order? He ordered some pancakes. And the other guy didn't eat and just sat there and watched him eat his pancakes. And he kept looking at his watch. And here, before long, he got up and hurried up and walked out and didn't pay for his own. He had his assistant pay for his, for his food. Think about that. You come into millions of dollars and then gamble it away. That's the bird that Solomon talks about. It grows wings and flies away. It's here today and gone tomorrow. Covetousness. Covetousness is a grave and serious sin of the spirit and the mind and disposition with grievous consequences. I want you to turn to Luke 12, 15. I'm going to give you some verses here that talk about covetousness. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And again, please, folks, I want to put this in context. I feel like I'm a broken record here, but I'm not talking against a person working hard and being productive and having a budget and saving some money and investing in some things to, that will help your family. I'm not against that. We should all try to be frugal and try to be smart. What I'm preaching against here is someone who falls in love with money. And, and, and pushes God aside and says, no, 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 I'm not going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to follow after riches. That person is in for heartache. That person is in for pain. Amen. We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. So we're not preaching against working hard and being productive and being efficient and, and, and saving money and investing. Please don't walk out of here and say, Pastor says I should just give everything to everybody. That's not what I'm preaching. What I'm talking about is the sin of covetousness. Luke 12, 15. Let's go there. Luke 12, 15. Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. So here, Jesus just nails it between the eyes. And he said, For a man's life consisteth not... And the abundance of the things which he possesseth. You know what? You could put your financial statement together and hand it to the bank and think, this, is, this right here, this piece of paper, is the sum total of what my life is worth. And Jesus says, that's not true. Jesus says, when I look at you, I don't look at you and say, the sum of his life is worth what he or she owns. Assets minus liabilities equals net worth. Jesus says, no, that's not how I look at people. The bank may look at you like that. A lender may look at you like that because of risk analysis. But Jesus says, I don't look at you like that. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Jesus says, I look at you as a soul. And I gave my life for you. Whether you don't have two dimes to rub together or whether you're the richest person in the room, I love you the same, Jesus says. Man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then he tells this parable about a rich man who got kind of full of himself and said, what am I going to do with all my money? Verse number 19. I'm going to say to my soul, soul, thou hast many goods laid up many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And in verse 20, God interrupts this rich, arrogant person and says, thou fool, tonight your soul will be required of thee. Who shall these things be 
which thou hast provided. Verse 21, he sums it up. And verse 21, Jesus draws the connection between verse 15, where he warns us of covetousness, and the parable he just told. And he said, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself. But then there's a comma and says, and is not rich toward God. See, so it's not a sin to invest and be frugal and be productive. Where it becomes sinful is when you start pushing God out and start focusing on the things of this world. Jesus says, let me tell you something. You better not provide for all these things and forget about eternity. Because if you got a mansion to live in and you got the best of doctors and you got a bank account that's just oozing with money, but if I come tonight and take your soul, who's going to get all this stuff? Somebody say amen. Let's go to Colossians 3, 5. Let me give you another verse on covetousness. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 5. <clears throat> right after the book of Ephesians, Philippians. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he lists the different things. Fornication. So we should kill any desire of fornication in our life. Uncleanness. We should kill any desire of uncleanness in our life. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. All right. So he lists six things here. The first four have to do with sexual impurity. And Paul says, you need to kill these things in your life. Mortify. That's what the word mortify means. The root word for mortify is from the Latin mort. We get our word mortician, mortuary, mortgage, unfortunately. These all come from the root word death. And Paul says, you need to, you need to kill some things in your life. Fornication, a married person stepping outside of the bonds of marriage. Uncleanness, any desire for anything outside of your marriage, inordinate affection, putting affection on something or somebody that you have no business touching or looking at, evil concupiscence, which is weird, kinky, out there stuff. Christians don't, we don't engage in any of that. Oh man, Christians, Christians are just bored. No, 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 friend. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable and all and the bed is undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. You can be in a happy marriage and you can have Cupid's arrows flying and hearts bubbling and popping and all kind of emojis happening in your life and you can keep it alive, but you just do it God's way. You don't have to get all weird and nasty and ugly with it. Amen. Notice the next thing he says. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Now look at that. When I read, read that a couple weeks ago and I was studying and I was getting prepared, I thought... Out of all the things that God could have put in this list, he lists five things, actually six, covetousness, which is idolatry. He starts off the first four of sexual impurity, and then he puts covetousness behind that. Maybe covetousness has the same damaging power as some of these other things that we would all agree have damaging power. Okay? But notice what he said about covetousness, and I think this is why he puts it in the list. Covetousness equals idolatry. Now, Christians, you would never, ever stick a stack of money on your kitchen table and say, Oh, I worship you, I worship you. We wouldn't do that. We would never do that. But you can live your life in such a way where the actual outcome of the way you conduct yourself is the same thing as worshiping money. Somebody say amen. Let's go to Exodus 20, 17. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. So here, right in the Ten Commandments, the Lord is dealing with things that we shouldn't do. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. That's good advice. Keep your eyes on your own wife. Don't covet his manservant. We don't have servants anymore, but... Don't covet his property. Don't covet his maidservant. Don't covet his ox or his donkey. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Don't covet it. If it's your neighbor's and it's not yours, it's not yours. Okay? But we live in a generation where people are just 
greedy and full of covetousness. And everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses. And as Bishop used to say, by the time you catch up with the Joneses, they're going to refinance everything they have. So you might catch up with them, but after they refinance, they're going, you're going to be left high and dry. Just live your life and be happy with your life. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Let me give you one more verse here about covetousness. Luke 16 and 15. Jesus said unto them, Ye are they which, te- which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. So things that men look at and say, Oh, that person's got this or that. Wow, they're, they're powerful. God says, I look at the very same thing and I say, I hate that. It's an abomination. So I want to start looking at stuff the way God looks at stuff. I don't want to look at things the way man looks at things. I want to look at things the way God does. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, we're talking about attitudes toward money. The first attitude, we dealt with this thing called riches. The second attitude, we dealt with this thing called covetousness. And let me finish by giving you this third concept. And I'm just going to say the word thorns. And then you'll understand when I turn to Mark 4.19. Mark 4.19, Jesus is giving the parable of four different types of ground. Four different Soils are enumerated that can grow up and choke the spiritual life from us. And look how Jesus styles this. He says, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So there's four types of ground, right? There's the good ground. There's the stony ground, there's the thorny ground, there's the wayside ground. But in the thorny ground, he said, in that type of ground, there are four types of thorns. And he goes through these. So four types of ground, but in the thorny ground, four types of thorns. The the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world, the lusts of other things, and the pleasures of this life. How we need to seek a balanced life regarding possessions and we need to be cognizant of the fact that we can gain the whole world and lose our soul. And that's important. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Give me just a few more minutes. Let me wrap this up. We will not finish this lesson today. Probably have to finish next week, but give me just a couple more minutes here. Give you a few more verses. I hope you're taking notes. I see some of you taking notes and that's good. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies, Solomon said. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Wow. Here's the wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. And he said, look, Lord, I see the ditch on both sides of the road. There's a ditch on the one side of the road because if I follow after money, I could become arrogant and high-minded and, 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 and trust in riches. Then there's a ditch on the other side of the road. If I, if I am arrogant and proud and wanting to be rich, I could also fall in love with money. Solomon said, I want to stay in the middle of the road. Don't give me riches and don't give me poverty. Just let me be average. Feed me with con- food that is convenient for me. Are you looking what Solomon said? Boy, this so- kind of sounds like what... Paul told Timothy, having food and raiment, be content. 1 Timothy 6 says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Boy, it sounds a lot similar to what the Holy Spirit told the Apostle Paul to write about in the New Testament. The same Holy Spirit is overshadowing Solomon as he's writing in the Old Testament. And he says, Lord, I don't, and, and, and Solomon, he was probably in our vernacular he was a billionaire he was he was a wealthy man at this time and he said I see danger on both sides just let me have food convenient verse 9 here's why lest I be full and deny thee and I say who is the Lord or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain so Solomon the wisest man that ever lived said you know what I see danger on both sides and I don't want to fall into either extreme camp. I want to be just 
happy to be alive, and I want to just trust God to take care of me today. And after all, folks, the Lord will take care of his people. David said, I once was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I will guarantee you something. You put God first, and this is a guarantee. You put God first. You trust God. You get in the word. You come to church. You get baptized in Jesus' name, get full of the Holy Ghost, and live a righteous life. And I'm, I don't mean perfect, but I mean you strive to be the best you can be. Honor God in your, in your tithes and offerings. Come to church and be faithful. Keep your spirit right. The Lord will make sure you always have something to eat and you have a place to live. Friend, that is a guarantee. You say, you better be careful, Pastor. Listen, I can be safe saying that because the Bible says it. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy, but it means you're going to be taken care of. What did Jesus say? Consider the lily of the field, how they toil not. Consider the sparrow. He said, I take care of all them. Surely I can take care of my people. Matthew 16, 26. Matthew 16, 26. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now I'm going to stop there. And then next week, I'm going to take some time, if you want to write this down, and we're going to do a case study on three different people. Excuse me, four different people, actually. I, I, I added one. We're going to do a case study in the Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter 7, on a man by the name of Achan, who allowed materialism to cloud his judgment. And it caused he and his family to die. And even worse than that, it caused several innocent soldiers of Israel to die in the next battle because sin was in the camp. Then we're going to do a case study on the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. We don't know his name. The Bible just says he's a rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19. Then we're going to do a case study on this interesting individual called Gehazi, the prophet's servant, in 2 Kings chapter 5. And last of all, the one that I added recently, we're going to do a case study on what I'm going to call the two rich men. Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 16. Jesus told two different stories about two rich men. And I hope that once we study all four of these individuals, actually five if you count the two rich men in the scripture, Old and New Testament, and kind of do a case study of what happened to these people. What caused these people to lose their moorings and follow after materialism. I hope by the end of that, the Lord can give all of us wisdom and settle in our hearts that God will supply all of our needs. If God can feed Elijah with ravens and he can sustain the widow of Zarephath, if he can feed Israel with manna, let water come out of a rock, feed 5,000 on one occasion and 4,000 on another occasion with some loaves and fishes, if he sees the sparrow, every time a sparrow lands and takes off. How many millions of times does one sparrow in its life land and take off? I mean, they're constantly moving. I don't even think they sleep. They probably do, but I don't know when they sleep. If he sees the sparrow and, and he supplies beauty to the lily, surely God can take care of us. And we can focus on the things that matter in life, such as our prayer life and our walk with God and our relationship with people. Amen. And let God take care of the stuff that God takes care of. Somebody say amen. 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 That's a good stopping point. Let's all stand together, please. And next week we'll get into these four case studies. Bring something to write with and take notes. If you're a note taker, if not, certainly you can go back and listen on the Facebook page, my Facebook page or the church website or YouTube. We have it up uploaded there as well. Let's pray together. Father, we receive your word today. Thank you for this opportunity to study this very important topic of contentment. I pray that all of your people would understand the healthy attitude that we should have toward money, the healthy attitude and the balance in life that we should have toward the things of this world. We need money just like we need air and we need fire and we need water and we need food. But Lord, we should never fall in love with money because the love of money is the root of all evil. Help us to control it and help us to master it so it doesn't control us and it does not master us. Help us to take in, take to heart the biblical approach to 
finances and the biblical approach to dealing with this important topic. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen. Amen. We're going to take our break. God bless you. We'll start service right at 11. You're dismissed in Jesus.